to ITV News Time 6. Tonight's headlines. Clear my name. A former sub postmaster from Teesside joins hundreds of other victims of the Horizon scandal, hoping to have his conviction quashed by a new law. It's not just me. There are hundreds, if not thousands, out there. But sadly, some aren't here to. trial of a mother accused of murdering her three-year-old son. Here she beat him with a cane and failed to seek medical help for severe burns for more than a fortnight. Also tonight, ahead of steam, the massive job of moving 45 trains at a county Durham museum. And going for gold, the North Yorkshire racehorse, hoping the odds are in his favour at Cheltenham. Thanks for joining us. First tonight, then, some postmasters in the North East will join hundreds of others who will finally see their wrongful convictions quashed by the introduction of new legislation today. It follows the Horizon scandal, the computer system introduced by the post office, which wrongly claimed there were thousands of pounds of discrepancies in taking. Some postmasters were then ordered to make up the false shortfalls with their own money or even faced prosecution. Our correspondent, Rachel Bullock, has the story. Nearly a thousand sub postmasters were prosecuted by the post office during the Horizon scandal. Keith Bell was one of them. After spending his entire £16,000 in life savings to make up the false shortfall at his Stockton branch, he was then wrongly convicted of false accounting. I was prosecuted in 2002. I was given 200 hours of community service when the conviction was issued. The conviction totally changes your life because you then look at what sort of applications you can put into jobs and things you can do. I decided to become a driving instructor, so I took my qualifications. Then the DVLA decided, because I had a conviction, they removed my license. So I'm back to square one again. I was thinking about my son going to university, I was thinking trust funds or whatever. I was not being able to do any of that. It was past angry. You know, it was past angry. On Monday, Mr. Bell was given the all clear after five years of cancer treatment. Yesterday, he heard the news that his post office conviction was to be quashed. I heard this news, and quite frankly, this is what is over, over 50. It was bitter yeah. news for you because that's the shadow it's cast over your life. Yeah. It puts into perspective the devastation that the post office scandal has, has caused you. Absolutely. It, it, it's not just me. There are hundreds, if not thousands, out there. Sadly, some aren't here to, to take it on. The only way to stop it is to prove that I'm not a thief. Their story shown in the ITV drama, which led to a national outcry. I haven't got that money. If that drama had not happened, do you think... We wouldn't you... be sitting here today. Thank goodness for Alan Bates. Wrongly convicted sub-postmasters will also receive £600,000 compensation, as well as having their convictions overturned. Those who were not convicted but had to make up false losses with their own money are entitled to £75,000. Mr Bell, though, says no amount can truly right the wrongs. The post office has a, had a fantastic reputation, as we only had, but that reputation was because of postmasters and postmen and not the, the people in the hierarchy that were making these so-called decisions. A long fight, with many feeling there are still more questions to be answered. Rachel Bullock, ITV News, Stockton. Our political correspondent Tom Sheldrick is at Westminster. Tom, this mass exoneration is unprecedented from the government, isn't it? It is, Julia. Normally, convictions have to be quashed in the courts, but there have been 983 convictions linked to this faulty horizon system, and so far only around 100 have been overturned. Ministers say that's not happening quickly enough, and so they will exonerate everyone uh, together. They announced that approach in January after that ITV drama put this scandal to the top of the agenda. Since then, they've been drawing up the precise legislation which was formally introduced here in Parliament earlier today.
I want to pay tribute to all post martyrs who have campaigned tirelessly for justice, including those who tragically won't see the justice that they deserve. Today's legislation marked an important step in finally clearing their names. And across this house, we owe it to them to progress this legislation as soon as possible before summer recess. Well, that means this should become law in July. It does have to go through Parliament first in the normal way, though we're expecting that to happen at speed with the other parties clear that they will support it. The government say it will then immediately open the door to many victims uh, uh, getting uh, to accept that £600,000 uh, fixed offer of compensation or choosing to pursue an individual uh, claim. The main questions remaining here, though, are around just how quickly compensation will be paid to all of the victims of this scandal. Time at Westminster, thank you. To those other main news stories now, at a court has heard a mother has admitted beating her three-year-old son with a cane and failing to seek medical help for severe burns for more than two weeks. Christina Robinson denies murdering her son, Delania, and a charge of child cruelty. Today, she told Newcastle Crown Court that burns to the lower half of his body had been caused accidentally with a shower. Well, our correspondent Tom Barton was in court. Tom, what was the court told on the evening Delania died? Well, Greg, Christina Robinson sat today in the witness box wearing a black shawl and a grey jumper dress. She told the court that on the night Delania died, she was watching TV with him and her other son when she heard a gargling, gasping sound and saw him loll to the side. He had, she said, been eating a cheese bath and she said that she removed food that had been obstructing his airway before she started CPR. Now, the court has previously been told that Delania died as a, as a result of a major head injury caused by him being shaken or a head impact or both. Christine Robinson suggested that he had fallen on his face a few days before and that he'd also fallen twice that day. She also admitted today that it took her 19 minutes to call 999 after Delania passed. And so what did Christine Robinson say about Delania's burns? Well, the court has heard that after Delania's collapse, she told paramedics, police and doctors that the burns had been caused by Delania playing on his own in the shower. Today, she admitted that wasn't true. She said, in fact, they were the result of him, her cleaning him in the shower after he'd soiled himself. Asked why she didn't get the burns treated by a doctor, she said for the first few days, they looked very minor. Once it became apparent, though, they were more serious, she said she didn't seek help because so many days had passed. I just felt ashamed. Christina Robinson today also admitted that she hit Dulania with a garden cane after watching the teachings of the black Hebrew Israelite religion that she followed on a YouTube video. She said she did it because he was messing about with his food. A decision she thinks now was misguided. Christina Robinson denies murder and child cruelty. The trial continues tomorrow. Tom, the latest from that trial. Thank you. Moving on to other news. And the Member of Parliament for Middlesbrough, Andy MacDonald, has been reinstated as a Labour MP. He was suspended after using a controversial phrase at a pro-Palestine rally in October. Labour say their investigation found he didn't break party rules, but reminded him of being mindful of how politicians' words may be interpreted. Mr MacDonald said today, I bitterly regret the pain and hurt caused, and I will not use that phrasing again. £38 million pounds of improvements to the Foss Barrier in York have saved hundreds of homes and businesses from serious flooding this winter. That's according to the Environments Agency. The pumping station has been tested by several storms over recent months. Experts say recent upgrades have made the city far more resilient. The Foss Barrier is probably one of the most um, technologically advanced stations we've got in the agency at the moment. And that's on top of the extra funding capacity, the top of the bigger barrier gate, and the top of the increased height of the flood wall means that this is now set for the future. You're watching ITV News Time Team. Still to come on tonight's programme. Avoiding the obstacles, the brothers getting ready to represent their country in a rather unusual event.
and weather-wise, there's been plenty of showery rain around today. Plenty more to come tomorrow, but mild weather too. All the details in just a few minutes. An RTV News investigation has found children's lives have been put at risk by dangerous driving and parking outside their school gates. Almost every head teacher we've surveyed has come across issues from speeding drivers to parents parking on double yellow lines or zigzags. It's a widespread problem and even traffic calming measures apparently aren't always enough to deter drivers. Lauren Hall reports. It's a familiar sight outside many of our schools. Drivers stopping where they shouldn't and not stopping where they should do. It's no different on the roads outside this primary school. OK, so on a daily basis, we have parents parking all the way down here on the yellow lines. We have parents and other members of the public using this the main route into the town centre to often skip some of the cars that are parked. And I don't quite clearly see the traffic lights and the parents that are waiting, which is always a risk. And we have had a parent a couple of years ago with her child in a buggy knocked by a car. Parents on the school run are used to it. It's quite dangerous, even when you're trying to cross, you can wait for the lights, but there'll be cars stacked up and some normal try and go around. It can get quite, quite dicey along this bit of road. I think just with kids crossing the road and people coming out creates congestion, creates confusion, you know, so it's not a great thing. But I also, I also get why, why people do it. There isn't anywhere to park around here. Well, I think people just need to follow the rules really, don't they? It's like, not park where they want them to, it'll probably help them. We've surveyed more than a hundred head teachers, and nearly all of them say they've noticed driving or parking near their school, which they feel is dangerous. Half have had pupils involved or nearly involved in a serious or fatal road traffic incident. And three quarters have had to ask the police to patrol nearby roads. We've heard from head teachers about pupils being injured, and we were told of two incidents where children have been killed. Sharon Northcott's been voicing her concerns about the roads outside her son's primary school. A child was knocked down and killed a number of years ago, and she worries it could happen again. She says the biggest issue is drivers not stopping at this pedestrian crossing. It's very dangerous. I mean, we've, we've had um, a fatality of a child before already. Uh, we've had several accidents which have had, where they have been hit, and loads and loads of near misses where you're either yanking your children out the way or you're having to stand there and watch cars go past on a green man. Friends are also being put at risk in other ways. This dash cam footage was taken on a practice run by Tyne and Weir Fire and Rescue Service. It shows how cars parked outside busy North Tyneside schools can slow down emergency vehicles and even stop them getting through. It's why in some areas they've had to take action. Outside this school, you can't help but notice there's hardly any traffic. That's because there's restricted access on this road at certain times of day when children are coming to and from school. And it's already making quite a difference. It's the school streets initiative and they've been trialling it for the past six months. People are concerned about children's safety and it feels much calmer and quieter and children coming and going um, with, with just almost no traffic is, is much, much safer for, for all of them. It's been welcomed by parents, although one couple told us some drivers aren't paying attention. It should be working, but the signpost is there, people are just clearly disregarding it driving down the street so they can clearly visible and just ignoring it. Yeah, it really does need to be reinforced over and over again to finally get there with the other drivers. Even with the restrictions in place, it seems some drivers just aren't thinking. And that's the issue outside many of our schools, with head teachers telling us it's putting lives at risk every day. Lauren Hall, ITV News. The ITV Evening News continues at 6.30 with Mary Nightingale. Coming up in the programme, claims the Prime Minister is trading money for morals. Russia's Nancy on Rishi Sunak to hand back millions in party funding after admitting the Tories' largest donor had made comments she called racist and wrong about the MP Diane Abbott.
Sir Keir Starmer's vow to legalize assisted dying in the next parliament and turn on the subtitles. The Hollywood star joining forces with parents in Essex to get children reading while watching TV. Okay, for those stories and more at 6.30. and Middlesbrough, who suddenly look in serious danger of rejoining the championship playoff chase. Last night, this stunning strike from Riley McGree sealed the points for Michael Carrick's side away at Birmingham City. It was all so far as game in hand. They're now five points off the top six with momentum clearly behind them. Now, it's been described as the Olympics of horse racing, of course, Cheltenham. And if that is the case, then the Gold Cup has to be the 100 metres. Yes, the Blue Ribbon Race of the Festival takes place on Friday afternoon. And for the first time since 2019, a Yorkshire-trained horse will be among the field. The Real Whacker is trained in labour by Patrick Neville. But as Chris Stokes reports, he certainly enjoys his trips to Cheltenham. The Real Whacker and Julie Colon, the Real Whacker. He's already enjoyed one major win at the world-famous Cheltenham Festival. Now, 12 months on, the real whacker is going for gold. To have an honour in the World Cup is special for us. My memory is like me. <laughs> uh, and then it's 100 years of the World Cup. It should be special again if we could manage to win it. What are the chances, you think? As sure as you can, we have really as good a chance as anyone. Uh, the horse is prepared especially for, for the Gold Cup. Uh, since he went last year, that was the aim. And nothing changed along the way. So he's gone he's step by step, he's, he's came. So hopefully he will be peaking. The real whacker is a real favourite of this stable here in Leyburn. Not so with the bookies. He's currently priced 33 to 1, but if he can upset the odds, Wacker would be the first Yorkshire trained winner of the Gold Cup since Chidami in 1993. What would it mean, do you think, to Yorkshire, to the region, to have a winner at the Gold Cup? It would be an absolute buzz for the, for the region. I think the yard uh, here would be on a high for weeks. Um, and it, it's, it's just something, you know, a lot to talk about. We, you know, we, we, can, we, we love our racing in Yorkshire, uh, and a Yorkshire winner at the Gold Cup would be just fantastic. Now, I'm whispering this quietly because I don't want to upset any other horses, but the real whacker really is the star of these stables. But just next door, come over here. This is the real whacker's sister. She's called my favourite sister. And there's real high hopes for this horse as well. She made her debut last night in Newcastle and uh, ran very well in the book book. I'm delighted with her. She, she's uh, something to look forward to as well, yeah. She manages himself. Uh, she probably was a bit better ground than me, but... Well, Big Bro is certainly a fine role model, and if he can claim yet another Cheltenham win, the party back here will be a real cracker for the real whacker. Chris Dawkes, ITV News, Labour. Sounds like it could be the real deal. Now, two young brothers are celebrating after qualifying to represent their country, but it's not an event you may have heard of. No, it's a very cool-sounding event. 14-year-old James and 11-year-old Thomas Jarman from South Shields took part in their first obstacle course junior championships last year. Remarkably, they were both placed in the Ninja Warrior-style events, which means they can compete on an international stage. and Thomas hanging out together on their homemade frame as they prepare to represent Britain. They started obstacle course racing for fun with their parents. There it was then. But in October, they decided to compete in the sport. James came first in his category and Thomas fourth. That meant they qualified to become part of the British obstacle sports national team. Felt amazing. Can't believe I came first. So I'm now qualified for World Championships in Costa Rica and the European Championships in Italy. 
and ultimately very well and come fast again. And I didn't really expect to do well as it was my first competitive race, but I ran and it was really hard and there were some world class people there, so I was really happy to get fourth. As part of the competition, the boys had to take on gladiator style obstacles designed to test strength, skill and endurance, including travelator hills and swinging rings. All the family enjoy the sport and the children have excelled, thanks to support from their school. Some of the races they've always put on children's ones, so mini versions that you do, and they really enjoyed those, and gradually they, get, they got more interested in the competitive side of that. And how did you feel when they qualified? I was quite amazed, really. I found it wasn't something I really, I really expected, because we've never really tried to do any of the competitive side before, so it was um, very proud. Oh, it's just brilliant. Um, I was really proud of them to, to step up and be competitive. You know, it's not easy to stand on the start line with uh, people who've been doing it for a long time and, you know, to really put yourself out there and really go for it. So, very proud, yeah. The pair will be heading to prestigious events in the UK and abroad this summer. It's particularly special that the boys can support each other in the competition. It's great having, it's great having him there to like support me and to just like make me keep on going. It, it just feels amazing to be getting out there and representing Britain against all the other countries. James and Thomas have taken the challenge in their stride and are looking forward to reaching the dizzy heights of representing their country. Julie Harrison, ITV News. move was difficult check this out the new hall at Shildon's locomotion is being decked out but it's not an easy job it's been about a two-year process we've had to move vehicles in lots of different ways we've had to really think about each individual vehicle and work out how it can move because some of them are very fragile or delicate we've had to skate things which is like on little roller skates we've had to stunt them which is the traditional method We've had to crane things, all the planning that's gone on and that really hard work between everyone. It's made it great to get it all into, into here and really quickly and, um, and there's not many more to go now. So it's a, really good, it's a really good feeling, yes. It's a mammoth task moving these huge vehicles into their new home in the hall here. In total, 47 vehicles will be shunted over the next few weeks. Today, the team are moving around four or five vehicles. This being the latest addition, the Sentinel shunter that was used in industry. And it's not just locomotives on display. You've got tanks, rail bikes, cranes, snow plows, even a cow. We're going to go right back to 1825, tell the story all the way through to the, the current day. So, I mean, I think it really kind of shows kind of what a complex industry the rail industry is. We're all familiar with passenger trains, but we've got things like snow plows, we've got steam cranes, we've got some of the oldest coal wagons, um, you know, there's a whole range of things, and I think visitors are going to be really surprised by the variety of things they're going to be able to see. And um, when we open, we're going to be home to the largest undercover collection of heritage rail vehicles. I mean, how brilliant is that? Many of the vehicles are local, from ICI, Newcastle Coal Yards, and many, of course, were at Sheldon Works. This year marks 40 years since its closure. Thousands of people lost their jobs. Their mark on our region's rail heritage will be remembered. One of the things we really want to do is, is to take pride in Sheldon and all its, its achievements. Um, you know, so it, going right back to Hackworth and what he did here, one of the roads in New Hall will be in, entirely devoted to vehicles that are built in Sheldon. Um, and of course, we're going to be doing something in June to, to mark the anniversary of the closure. Um, you know, it, it's a sad time, obviously, but this is about be, be proud of what you achieved. Well, this is life at Locomotion for the next few weeks. Moving and moving and moving again. 
but by the end of May, the doors will be open and a new chapter will begin. Jenny Henry, ITV News. That's what I call a big effort. Big job. Yeah. Weather time now with Jenny. Things are hot enough. Siri sponsors ITV Painties Weather. Hello, good evening. It's been a bit of a murky day for many places, but I think that's a touch of poor sun. The reason has been got this front that's been lurking across us, and it's been pushing its way a little bit further south, but is set to make its way further north. So you're going to see a few more outbreaks of rain, certainly a lot of clouds. Generally, we're going to start to see temperatures rising over the next few days, although we do have one or two cool days. So certainly remains a little bit unsettled, but hopefully into the weekend we will see a bit of sunshine. So here's this front, it's been lurking to the south, you can see it's slowly pushing its way a little bit further northwards as the evening progresses. Most of the rain is pinned back by the Pennines, so uh, out towards the North Sea coast there, generally a bit drier. And as far as temperatures go, because of the direction of the breeze and because of the dampness in the cloud, certainly not going to be chilly. Further south, double figures, a little bit fresher further north. As far as tomorrow goes then, a bit of a damp start for some, bit of a mixed bag, some breaks in the cloud, particularly in the lee of the Pennines, and then later on in the day as that front pushes a little bit further north, uh, many of us actually seeing some decent breaks, and with it some decent temperatures, looking at highs of 13 or 14 Celsius. That said, there is another little wraparound occlusion that could bring a few more showers later on in the day. So that's Thursday out the way. As far as Friday goes, yet another little frontal system bringing plenty more showers with them. But once that clears, opens the gateway to a little bit of cooler air coming down from the north, but still getting up to a respectable 11 Celsius. A chilly start on Saturday, but a bright one too. Cloudier later. Siri sponsors ITV Tainted Weather. And that's your lot for a Wednesday evening in just a moment, the national and international news. And I'll be back with an update at 10.30. Thank you for watching us. Join me later. Have a tea. Bye-bye. Bye-bye for now.